Mit navn er Line Røde Hansen. Jeg har en 15 år lang karriere bag mig, og jeg har oplevet de bedste og de værste sider af kvindefodbolden. Nu er jeg i FC Nordsjælland. Vi tror på, at kvindefodbolden skal gå sin egne veje. I skyggen af mændene, ignoreret af medier og sponsorer, men samtidig med en voksende popularitet over hele verden. Det er tid til at tage kontrollen tilbage. Denne podcast handler om kvindefodboldens rejse imod det fulde potentiale. Myterne, holdningerne og faxene. Vi er færdige med at brokke os. Vi er klar til at handle. Vi er klar til at flytte grænser i fodboldindustrien. For at finde vejen for den næste generation. Jeg vil sammen med en af mine holdkammerater invitere gæster, hvor vi forsøger at svare på, hvordan vi skaber en bæredygtig model for kvindefodbolden. Nogle afsnit vil være på dansk, and some of the episodes will be in English. In this first episode, I got my teammate with me, Brianne Reed. Hey Lena, thanks for having me. In our first episode, we sit down with Tom Vernon, Right to Dream founder and FC Nordsjælland chairman, who in 2013 took the decision to start the first girls' academy in Africa. Five years later, as a part of Right to Dream's takeover of FC Nordsjælland, women's football was launched here. Now the club has a professional academy in Denmark and a professional team. After four consecutive promotions, our senior team is now competing at the highest level in Denmark with one cup title to our name. But achievements on the pitch, that's just the start. We still have a long way to go for the industry to flourish into the game we all believe it can be. So what's the way forward? Let's find out. So, hi Tom. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. How are you feeling today? Great. I'm how, ready. How do you feel about our win yesterday? I didn't see the result. Oh, we won in the... a bad start, um, but uh, I don't have the... Um, The cup games aren't on uh, my Kuchu, are they? No. No, no. unfortunately not. And actually, we, uh, they're not on my app either. Uh, some of the results weren't showing on the app. Yeah. But a 4-1 victory, two goals by a center defender. Uh, Jesse scored two goals. Okay. Yep. From and corners? Or? One was a left-footed outside the box, just a banger, and the second one was off a corner. Oh, cool. Yeah. So now we're in the quarterfinal. Yep. So that's good. a good start. Defend. Defend the title. Oh, That's what Defend we're doing. the title. Let's go, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So we uh, we invited you here today because we are a bit curious mm. to hear about your thoughts, uh, your experience into women's football, and why mm. you you chose to go into uh, women's football. Mm. So to begin from the beginning, uh, we would like to hear about like what are your first experiences with women's football. Um I think uh, really was when uh, once we decided to um uh, go into women's football in Right to Dream in Ghana uh my first like real experience was the first trial that we did in uh, the north of Ghana and uh you have no idea what's going to happen um because we did we did uh, all the research that we could to see and 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 ask and everything but until you say in Ghana okay we're holding a trial and everyone who wants to get into right dream should come um and I I'll, I'll definitely remember like uh, my whole life the experience of that first trial and then um uh and then obviously the journey with uh the academy there and you guys have both been and you've seen it um, and we can talk about it in more detail um, but yeah that first trial was like my first physical experience and that must have been um, 2011 something like that so so before that you actually never watch a woman game you never saw in your whole like career in football Not that I can remember, no. Um, I coached, uh, I coached girls basketball before mm-hmm. that. I was actually a basketball player when I was younger, and uh, so when I went to Ghana, I um, uh, I was coaching uh, men's football, um, but I also decided to set up a small uh, basketball academy, 
and uh, I used the American school as the base. And uh, they said, okay, if you coach the girls' team, then you can um, you can uh, use this, the gym after school is closed to do what, what you want to do. And I'll also never forget, like, you know this thing they say when you die, like your life flashes in, in front of you. And there's like some experiences of coaching girls because I've been coaching guys my whole life, oh. which would like, it, it was so different, like much more different than I anticipated. So I think my first like, um, like personal women's sport experience was that and just like seeing the 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 way that girls would challenge your tactics or your ideas but once they accepted it then they did it and there was like a process of um of like more rational like questioning mm. to decide whether they buy into you or not but mm. once they do then they're in and compared to the guys where they maybe don't question mm. as much and then you never, or it takes much longer to be sure, like, are they in or are they not? And do they buy into it or do they not? Whereas there was more of a, um, a much more enjoyable process where if you could all get on the same page, then you could really do shit. And so- I do also think that- Are we allowed to swear? The... It's like Joe Rogan. We are? Yeah. Okay. If we're allowed to what? Swear. Sorry. It's got to be authentic, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll be swearing a lot. Um, so I love that. And um, yeah, and I still have like some of those, it's a long time ago now, but some of those like experiences and emotional moments. And it was just high school basketball, oh. so it's not a big deal. But some of the experiences and like some of the reactions from the girls like stayed in my mind. And then, yeah, and then the trial oh. in Tamale and... Um, I, I remember uh, we have one guy, he's a goalkeeper for New York Red Bull now, and he was from that town. And I remember this, uh, I was sat on one a chair, like just like this, and there was a long line of girls sat waiting to go for their like 15 minutes to try and get in. And there's these two girls and she one said, oh, I live on the same street as Rashid Nuhu. This is in Tamale. And she said, if he can go to university in America, then I definitely can. <laughs> and it was really funny because the guy like wasn't the brightest guy either. So it was like, he just managed to get into university, but it was this thing in my head of like, okay. And you start to see just the impact of organizing a trial and like the impact for that of girls starting to say, okay, I could change my dreams and I could have different dreams and I could aspire to achieve things because I've seen these boys and I don't think they're all that. And I, and I want to, um, uh, uh, go for it myself and then and then we also had girls there who were I don't know 14 and like when it was their turn to play they were handing their baby to somebody else mm. like hold my baby I'm gonna go and try out for this academy and then you're thinking like what are we doing here like are we actually gonna admit mothers into the academy and and just things that having done boys for so long that you never thought about and then mm. you like lean to the guys you're like so what happens if someone's got a, uh, a a daughter? Like, can she still get in? And everyone's like, I don't know. And like, <laughs> maybe we should. We haven't thought about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we should write a policy on uh, mm. on whether mums can get into right stream. So um, we've never done that, but it was just all this stuff that started to to f like challenge so many of of the ways that you'd seen things. Um, but I think those early coaching experiences always gave me like a motivation. And then when we got the girls into the academy and the, the, the relationships that you can build and their interpretation of opportunities is so different to a boy's interpretation of opportunities and the dynamic and the relationship. And it's, it's, um, it's really refreshing and really enjoyable. So yeah, that's my early early memories, but yeah, it's, I, I guess it's embarrassing, like trying to remember watching a game. I mean, obviously it's, you grow up as a fan and, and there's no visibility. Mm. Um, and uh, now you can see in England that you've got uh, games on mainstream TV, on the BBC, on a Saturday afternoon, um, and things are changing like really rapidly. Mm. Um, but as a kid, yeah. 
I, I, I never thought about it actually. But then I can tell that I didn't even see a game when I was a kid because yeah. it was not possible. Yeah. So that's also like showing a bit of the chains. Right. I have my mom, I let her use my VPN and she wants to watch the Women's English League. So she uses my VPN so that she can be able to watch, but it's still not accessible, totally accessible mm. everywhere. It's nice that they're showing it in England, but there yeah. are people who want to watch all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I took my family to the World Cup, the last World mm. Cup, and uh, one, I wouldn't have proposed to my family that we go to a men's World Cup. And two, going to any football during holidays is like my wife's <laughs> worst nightmare. Mm. Um, but we had a fantastic time and Common Goal had like a, they rented like a chalet for people involved with Common Goal, uh, I think just outside Lyon. Mm. And so we watched uh, both semi-finals and then and then my son enjoyed it so much that we had to go all the way to uh, Nice to watch the third and fourth place playoff, which is always like such a crap game. And this was a crap <laughs> game as well. But he liked the semi-finals so much and he got into it so quickly. But um, like, I think that, that the atmosphere around women's football provides like a really exciting way to travel the world as a family. Like if you have a dream to go to Australia one day or, or, or other places, then like tie it into the World Cup because mm. it's just like a in like a stress-free, really enjoyable environment. And um, it's it, like maybe a small thing, but like my seven-year-old, we were in the stadium in Lyon. He was like, I need the toilet. And I said, okay, go. And you just had this feeling that he could go and come back. And if he didn't, then somebody would help him and the vibe and the atmosphere was totally different. Mm. So mm. that for me is like, I was like really like curious and like paying attention to when they announce the next World Cup, where's it going to be? Because I want a reason to travel around mm. football and not have like an all in like immersive football experience, but go see a country and have some games at the same time and, and have my family and my wife who like just, it would be a, not what she wants to do she was like actually it was pretty fun and it was like family together so mm. you know that was cool as well so that was those were apart from fcn and right to dream then those were my first live games back to the idea of the the trial and when you had the girls lined up there at that point did you already have it in mind that you wanted a girls academy oh yeah it was all like planned yeah. so everything was like we we wrote the plan for I don't know, a year, raised some money, got some long-term commitments from the States to back the academy. And it was like, okay, we're doing this. Mm. And so, where, where does that, did that come from? Like, why did you want, it, want to also have a girls' academy? I think um, a lot of my inspiration comes from America in terms of, mm. uh, like, development strategies and a lot of the boys' stuff was from the student athlete model in America in the first place. And you guys know like what we do with boys going to America as well and, and all that kind of stuff. And now we have some some girls from FCN who've gone as well. Um, uh, but Title IX is obviously like when you hear Title IX, then you're like, you've never heard of anything like that before. Mm -hmm. And it's not a particularly, um, I don't think it's an, a well-known concept internationally. Not internationally. I only know it because yeah. it was... You're a benefactor. Right, exactly. It requires that certain pro certain schools have a certain amount of female sports in the program. I don't know if it applies just to sports or beyond that, but I'm pretty sure you have to, if you have X amount of male programs, and you also mm. have to have female programs. And, and you, can't invest, yeah. you yeah. can't invest more in the men's programs than the women's programs. Okay. Um, and so it was a game changer for female sport mm. in America um, because it like forced yeah, universities who, I don't know whether they wanted to do it or not, but they <laughs> weren't doing it uh, previously, um, but they forced them to do it. So, um, uh, and then they, and then I think they did a lot of it pretty properly. This isn't a soccer thing. This is sports in general. Mm. Um, and it, and it changed the landscape of American female sport. And so that was interesting as well. And, um, and then the, the chairman of uh, Right to Dream USA, he, he has two daughters and 
he would like the first time we ever took a boy to America, which must have been like 2004 or five. And it was like really early days for right to dream. He's like, do you have girls? I said, I haven't even thought about it because these boys are living in my house and I can't <laughs> imagine like having girls and boys living in my house. It wasn't that big. And then he kept going on and on and on and said, have you got girls? Have you got girls? And so it just sort of um, uh, uh, like was in the back of my mind and thinking, when could we do it? And, and you know, kind of hustling in Ghana like I was to get everything going. Then you would just sort of stop and look if you ever saw girls playing and think about it a little bit. Um, and then we managed to make it happen. And then obviously when we came here, then we started to do things much quicker than, mm. than we did in Ghana, where there was kind of a decade before we got into girls. And, and um, if we go anywhere else, then we'll, we'll start at the so same time. So it was time. not a question for you to, that you wanted to have a, like a women's department here in the Ocean as well? It was in the, like, the business model before we started. Mm. Um, whereas like when we started Ghana, uh, you guys, know, I think know a reasonable amount of the story. There was no business model. It mm. was just like, um, it was just like a reaction to a situation that we saw, which was like boys playing, uh, living in tough environments and playing unstructured football. And it was like, okay, I'm going to do something about this. Mm. But I was 19. So I didn't even know what a business plan was. Um, whereas when we came here, then it was like, okay, this is going to be before we go in and, when we were uh, speaking to various clubs coming here, then we say some of the owners of the clubs, yeah, we're going to do women's as well. And we got some pretty interesting reactions. Mm. And so it's like, okay, this isn't going to be straightforward because as progressive as Denmark uh, portrays itself to be, um, certain owners of football clubs in Denmark aren't particularly progressive on the issue of women's football. I was just curious about that. What's like been the differences of starting the girls' academy in at Right to Dream and then here in in Denmark? If there's been like different challenges and like, yeah. Yeah, it's totally different. I mean, mm. you've seen both as well, so you know it yourself. Um, you you just uh, we had no idea like how a parent's going to react, and and. Um, I guess we were especially concerned about Muslim mm. parents in Ghana, and how were they going to how were they going to react? Um, and it was very positive, and and you know, and what you see is that, like, the overriding human emotion is like the desire for a better life for your kids than you lived, and so um, even if there's kind of religious uh, sort of principles or beliefs that might that, that lead you to think oh they're not going to allow it I think when you say we have an opportunity for your daughter mm -hmm. even if she should be at home or getting married or doing the cooking or whatever else there's a deeper emotion in parents which is like this could change her life and I, and I want that for mm -hmm. her even in some of the more um, uh, traditional um, traditional families so all those kind of challenges obviously you don't um, you don't encounter that here. Um, and parents are just much more like, my kid should do what she enjoys to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're you know, almost completely different in terms of uh, yeah, the project. So I was thinking a bit about, because you, you mentioned this, that in USA they have this I don't know if it was was in school a rule or that Title they have nine. to have yep. they are forced to have the girls um, as much girls uh, programs, programs yep. than, than than boys programs, yep. and I know in Denmark there has been a lot of discussions uh, last couple of years in the way of we should force Superliga clubs mm. to have a, a women's department mm. and that it should be like a demand. Mm. For Superliga club to have a women's department mm. to be, like in the Superliga, mm. so I, I would like to hear your thoughts about that because you somehow say that's how you got started, in the way of that idea that that changed the game, uh, changed in in the US. Yeah. Uh, and if you think that's the way forward, you think that's a demand that should be. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think it should mm. be. Um, 
and I can tell from the tone of your question that you don't think so either. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I think that, you know, that, that rule in America applies to a, a university mm. where you have 50% girls anyway, mm. and then you're not running sports programs to the quality that you are for the, um, uh, for the boys. So it's a different context to imply, like to put a rule like that in. Um, but if you don't want to do it, then you shouldn't be in it. Um, and so, uh, so I definitely don't think it should be forced. Um, and I'm a big believer in, um, in having some independent uh, brands that aren't affiliated with the men's game uh, coming up and um, I don't want to I don't want to make headlines on you know what we're going to do in the future but I do believe that like our future will be in uh, developing brand a brand for our women's football which is unique and bespoke and speaks to what the women's game stands for and or our women's game stands for mm. and doesn't have um uh, isn't just viewed like oh it should be a photocopy or a, a replica of what's going on on the men's side um like a simple example is like uh, when you're going to have all academy academy players playing in the girls team mm -hmm. and you can ask why do you say that uh, well because that's what you do with the boys mm. um and i don't believe in that kind of thinking and i don't believe that our club here should say our vision is only is is to get academy kids in we should think about what's best and how do we want to do it for the for for the women? And like, we love having you in our team, and you're not from the academies. Mm -hmm. So like, why why should we do it like that? There's different ways that we can build it. So, but I think unless you want to get in, um, and unless you've got a reason for getting in, like a why reason, mm -hmm. but also a um, like a view of a business model reason, then you shouldn't be in. Um, because otherwise it's just going to end up as a as like a charity charity thing and and every time you have budget meetings then like the number of mm. you know the num like in corona the number of people who are like okay first thing women's let's cut there yeah. um and so uh, so i don't think it should be forced at all and it would be really nice to see some independent brands i know like for Fortuna, it's been a bit um, tough with Corona and everything else, but they, they still did a good job against us last mm -hmm. week. Um, so those independent brands, I think, are, are great. And that's more of my vision for mm. the future of women's football. Because it's interesting to see that at the moment how women's football is growing, that's the big men's club you see in England, how it's 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 the big clubs over there who takes in the the female team now, teams now. Yeah. Uh, so if you like look at how it's been growing the last couple of years, mm. how it went really quick. Mm. That is probably due to the big men's clubs going into women's football. With one percent of their budget, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, we've had maybe this less, discussion. Maybe before. less than one percent. Yeah. yeah, I think it's less. <laughs> we've had this discussion and I think for a while I was on the other side. I was like, if there's a men's club, there's gotta be a women's team attached to it. And I see more now that that same thing you were saying. I wouldn't want to be a part of a team just to fulfill a requirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're going to give us the bare minimum just because they have that box checked. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to see why that's not a good idea. But for a while, I was I was set. I was like, mm -hmm. if you have a men's team, you have a budget, you put a women's team there with it. Yeah. I think I have also the same feeling of that was how I could see it happens mm -hmm. because it's so difficult maybe to believe in, in like i want to believe yeah. in a different future where it grow by itself when where but because the easy way is to think that just you already it have all this money in a men's club why don't you just put it in but now i've i've been there myself i've been in different big clubs and i felt how sometimes you're just there to be there yeah and and that feeling that's personally the feeling i don't want to be there in the future right. yeah um, so that's that's why I don't believe in equal pay mm. uh, in the women's game, mm -hmm. um, because I think that I think that uh, it's very early days, and we have to be bold enough to imagine that women could be paid more than men. Um, and if we're if we're like benchmarking it against men, then I I don't think that we focus enough on like creating the business model and creating the unique product 
and seeing how profitable profitable it can be. Um, and you know, if you take Serena as an example, like she earns more, I guess, than almost every male player. And and a lot of them, like you look at Naomi coming up in tennis as well now, mm-hmm. and they earn more, and they create a brand and they create an attraction, which is like we'll we'll command our own market value for our product. Yeah. And while that is below the men's, for me, like benchmarking it against the men's is a mistake. Um, and you know. I don't know the detail with this like scandal in the US around how much the the girls are getting paid, but benchmarking that against the men when you're talking about like a very very average uh, men's national team that I don't know do they ever get out the group stage maybe once they, didn't qualify, they got out yeah, the group no. stage sometimes they don't qualify against a multiple world champion why would you be comparing yourself to them right mm. like go after your thing and like value your product and that's and that's where I think like for the building of the women's game, and I don't see this happening, but it's what I believe, it's like, just get all thought of the men's out and build the product and build the future and then see what the commercial value is. And the value is the value and then you get paid accordingly, even with the national teams. And I understand it's a different argument because because you're representing the country, but still it's a commercial product. And, And why should we believe that like it can't be more successful than the men because so, like some of the stuff with the men's the values suck and and uh, and parents or kids like you can look at some of it and say i don't like when i enjoy going to the world cup with the with the women's when i go to the euros with the men's and there's like russian army gangs like raiding the streets and beating the crap out of everybody in the south of france yeah. for the was it the euros or the world cup the euros and it's like what like what is that and why and why do we want to benchmark any mm. kind of commercial success around that product True. let's have our own product and see what we can get for it and let's have a 20 30 year vision and it's not going to be um us that enjoy the fruits of the labor but um one of my favorite quotes is that uh wise men plant trees whose shade they know they're never going to sit in and for the and what has to happen with the women's game now is that we have to plant trees which we're not going to enjoy the shade of like we're going to be in the sun and we're going to get burnt and it's going to like it's not going to be great um but you can if you plant the right seed then eventually there'll be a tree which um girls will sit in the shade and it'll be like this is cool and we like this and um but i don't see that direction and i don't see that like vision of leadership or someone who cares enough to like really get into it. So so then uh, when we go, if we go back to FC Norshallan mm. and here mm. and the structure here, like now I, I've been here for a little more than a year and you, you talk, we, we talked a lot about that. We, it feels like you've been here longer. Than yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I feel that too. <laughs> but now you talk about like, should it be separated? Mm. The male, the the men's and the women's department should it be integrated? Doing this year for me, it's been like we both try to think about it separated, because as you say, we want the women's game to grow by itself. Mm. But then at the same time, we also have the. It the feels like we've been more integrated back. In. In. Yeah, we're going back to being one club, right? Mm. And it's like, it's like difficult to know. Yeah, you know. Do we want to separate it completely? Do mm. we want to integrate it? Or is it possible to do somewhere in the middle where yeah. you still are one club, but you still can grow Our own beside products. each other? Right. Yeah. But I think if you look at um, like Right to Dream and FC Norseland, they're two separate things that are like very interdependent and they have separate brands and they're in different locations, but they're working together. Um, and they lean on each other um, and (coughs) uh, staff can go from here to Ghana and learn and grow and develop and come back and they can also contribute knowledge there and then it's the same the other way around and the players can do the same thing as well but it's different brands and and they speak to different people Um, but there's a lot of crossovers so I put it on the WhatsApp group this morning of this uh, uh, Ubuntu, which is uh, I am because you are. 
And so it's like independent interdependency of every uh, of everybody, and um, I can't do it without you. Um, but I but I'm also myself. Yeah. And I think that that's like the way that we need to think about it. That there's not that we don't like build this concrete wall between the two and say mm. like, okay, we're going on our different things, and we'll see who comes out on top. Mm. It's like we all want to lift each other, but we want our own identity, and we want to make our own decisions and uh, act according to the values that are relevant to us. And I think the values of, of women's football are so different to the values of men's football. So if you say you're totally together, then there's always going to be the tension of like what's underpinning our why and like why are we here and what are we actually trying to do? So it's um, like for you guys and, and you and me have spoken about this anyway, that it's like it's a frustrating period of like uh, figuring it out and learning as we go along and building something. But that's how I've always done it. It's like, it's much better to like get in there and start and get your hands dirty and like make some mistakes and learn some lessons. Um, but you have to like, but I have a big vision for where we want to go, specifically in women's football. Mm -hmm. And I'm used to like, when when I started and uh, and it's like, okay, could we have a school in Ghana that could get kids into Stanford and also into the Champions League and the World Cup? And then everybody say, no, you have to do one or the other. Mm -hmm. You can't, this, that's too big. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, I don't agree, so I'm gonna try. And then it takes a long time, but now we have kids in Stanford and kids playing in the Champions League from, from what we do. So, um, and, and it's again, like I said to you, it's like uh, people have to trust and in the early days, it was really hard for people to trust because we had no track record. Mm. But at least like now you can look at Right to Dream in Ghana and say, well, it started in my living room and now it's the nicest campus in Africa and produced all those kind of results. And so with the women's, um, I hope that we're like a bit smarter and less like hustly than we were in those days. But that's like the DNA of our organization is like get in, get your fingers dirty, make stuff happen, learn from your mistakes and find the solution because um, a school in Africa that does that isn't supposed to happen. There is no structure or finance mm -hmm. or regulation for that to happen. So you've just got to get in and start. And it's the same thing with women's football. Like there is no like designed pathway for it mm. to be successful. Mm. It's designed like not to work and so you've like you've got to be in there and and like let's say fight against the system a little bit and push mm -hmm. and learn your lessons and get some good people around you like we have and and like together say okay where, how are we going to figure this out and um that's how we do it and in a lot of places you can have kind of okay very clear business models and business rationales and until we can see like a very clear reason why we should do it we're not going to do it the CEO of FC Copenhagen told me that like four years ago. It's like, until I can see the business model, we're not gonna do it. Mm. It's like, well, then nothing's gonna change. So at least mm. like we get in there and and start and it's like not where we are, I'm proud of it, but it's like less than 5% of what I envisage of mm. where we're gonna go and what we're gonna, what we're gonna do. But you need to get some fellow travelers on board like you guys and, and start to figure it out and and find a better future and you've you've like come to some meetings with me as well and we've been exploring and talking to people and then obviously with Pippa coming on board um who's like the strongest advocate and one of the biggest brains for how we could develop women's sport in that way you make some of those hires um so that you've got the thinking and the capability to push it on I'm thinking back to when, earlier in the show when you mentioned about how we, I said that we wanted to have a right to dream girl in the academy and how the pathway uh, might not be the same as it is for the boys. And I'm wondering, I think I had a meeting with you um, last year sometime talking about in the meantime, seeing that the economy for women's football can't necessarily provide a life to live off of what are other options that girls have in terms of, okay, some go to the US for school, some come here. I was given an opportunity to have a job here which allowed me to stay in Denmark and mm. be able to play. Do you see things like that continuing to go forward 
offering those opportunities in the future or, yeah, just more about what different pathways and options the girls will have. I think I have like maybe a counter question because I've uh, like I've thought about this a bit and there's this, obviously this push to be fully professional, mm -hmm. mm. but then you told me like even when you are, then you want to do other stuff as well. Mm, we do. And so it shouldn't be dictated again by what the men do. Yep. Because the men go pro and then they play FIFA on their sofa all afternoon mm -hmm. and the women don't want to do that. So I don't want us to like do it in a patronizing way where it's like, oh, because we can't afford to pay you, then we can give you a job as well, which is like what we've done with you, which is great because mm -hmm. we love you and you love it here. So it's like, it's cool. But I do, you don't want to build a model where it's like, how do we avoid paying full salary. But in the meantime, do you think that's something, until we can get to the place where we're yeah. stable enough in that yeah. aspect, do you see that as something that is an option? Definitely. You know, it's like, that's the hustle, right? Yeah. It's like, you've got to do what you can to, to get to the next level. And you're hustling, we're hustling with you to try and take something to the next level. Right. But ultimately, like, you changed my mind on like, what is what does a full-time pro look like and it's not that just because you get your salary, then we're not interested in what you do the rest of the day. Because mm -hmm. that's also like, I think if you ask the most people, like, what is the goal for women's football? Mm -hmm. What is the goal here? Yeah, that we have a team that all are full-time professionals and they can play football and then they can live on it and they can feel good. Yeah. And I do believe that the goal is to be in a situation where the player can have the possibility to reach their full potential by being in circumstances and having an environment that make it possible for them for them to be fresh when they go to training mm. and maybe they don't come from a full-time job where mm. they're stressed and now they can really perform on the field right. but i don't think that it's because they only play football yeah i believe in that you like the goal should be that they at the same time are able to get education or maybe try or do some work by the side where they like. I think it comes down to just being able to have that option, mm -hmm. whether you want to sit on your couch and play FIFA all day, or you want to still be a full-time professional and have the option to still study or have a job on the side because it's what mm -hmm. you're interested in and what you're passionate about. I had a call yesterday from a, a teammate and she is studying and she was looking for internship because she had to do that through her studying. And she came up with, the, she was looking in which partners and sponsors we had in FC Norshan. And now she found two that, that actually fitted into her. So she wanted to come in contact with them. Mm. And I thought that's a brilliant idea. Mm. And now she, through our, the one in charge of the partners and sponsors, now she's in contact with one of the, the sponsors. We will see where it ends. But I think that's an amazing way of using our network to actually make it possible for her to both do her internship and to be a football player. And I think that's like that direction we need to go and think mm. future-wise. And I, I um, you know, when we talk about like, what's the why and like, why does our team exist? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the kind of feedback that you guys both gave me when you went to Ghana and also the stuff that the under 18 girls, when they went there, came back and said, it's like, we have 16 girls in Right to Dream and we have like 70 something boys in Right to Dream. And there's a lot of girls who um, are on the streets somewhere in West Africa with huge talents, either to go and get an amazing education like Adelaide or like Princess who will come here to come and play. So one of the things that I always thought was like, what if with your women's team after training, like figuring out how to take academies in the developing world to the next level was like part of what you did mm -hmm. hmm. because you have like fundraising uh, companies who can go and raise a ton of money or go and get sponsors and like what if as a team we said okay our objective as a team is to make sure that next year there's 26 girls in right to dream and we're gonna like find out how to do that mm -hmm. and that like then in terms of bringing the team together is like you achieve something on the pitch but off the pitch we're doing something as well. As well. Yeah. And that, you know, those, that could almost become its own business because like UNICEF, if you go to work for UNICEF, you get paid a salary, mm -hmm. but you're also raising and, and, and then distributing money. So I kind of had this like vision for the future. Um, and there's this series on, uh, on Netflix that I really love called Daughters of Destiny. 
I watched that. Did you like I it? I think Pippa was the one who told me to okay, watch it. Okay, yeah, I told Pippa to watch it. <laughs> okay. Did you like it? Yeah, it was really good. It's amazing. I and it. I just have this kind of feeling of like our women's teams with the way, and I can see how you guys are reacting to that. Mm. I, I don't want to be rude about the guys, but like if I said after training, we're going to set up a, a structure, which means that we're all like, raising money or sponsorship or building a model to help other people get into the academy but like, ah, I don't think we'd get that much traction mm -hmm. but I can feel this energy from you guys and from female players more generally it's like that could be really cool yeah and I could do it on mm -hmm. my sofa or I could go to an office and do it for two or three hours and then I'm happy to make some calls and reach into my network because it gives meaning and purpose so this is the kind of stuff that like I feel around the women's game, mm. which is why it needs to be different from the men's and we need to find out like our own way of operating and our own identity. Yeah. Um, and so, and then it's like, we're so busy that um, like we haven't progressed this stuff too much, but mm -hmm. that's the future that I see for us. And I feel we're, when you talk about the identity of the women's team, I feel like because we're still such a new program, we're still mm. trying to figure out what that identity is. Yeah. For the men's side, um, the youngest team in Europe. Mm. And have you thought about like what, since we're gonna be our own entity, our own product, have you thought about what that identity would be for the women's side? Well, maybe it could be like what we, what we talked about. Mm. That, um, we're as, uh, as successful as club as possible on the pitch, and that kind of is what it is. Um, but we're also a club that builds academies or yeah. we're also a club that our purpose is to make sure that girls who didn't grow up as privileged as you guys did or as I did get the opportunities that we've all enjoyed and like you've been there and you've seen you know even if even if uh, you know any of the players in our team had a tough like background it's nothing compared to girls in West Africa who won those opportunities or those girls in India who get into Shanti Bhavan. So that's always been my idea that like that could be something around the identity that we're here for something more than that. And we're here to lift the women's game and not just by like doing cool uh, Instagram posts or even by doing podcasts and other things to raise awareness, which is mm -hmm. all great, but like we actually do shit mm -hmm. and like we mm -hmm. go and we raise money or we go and and I don't want it to be like charity when I say raise money, but we go and build momentum. So what, you know, what Right to Dream does is breaks down the physical and psychological barriers that prevent you fulfilling your potential. So what if um, the women's team could do that for girls in West Africa or South America or, or even in like tough cities in America mm -hmm. or in, in, in Europe? So what you're saying is as well that you want the female players as well to take, change the game, game themselves in some way. Yeah. Like they are the ones that need to be involved. Yes. And they are the ones that can, by being a part of it, changing it together. Yeah. And, and I think that that's in, like, yeah. that then like provides the transition. If you're worried about like, mm. what am I going to do after playing? Well, if we, if we build something like that, then you just carry on doing that after right. you, and, and maybe then you go and like coach or run one of the programs that we've established and started to fund, or you stay in the office in Copenhagen because we're generating a load of money to run programs. But the other like key thing is, that's like my idea and my vision for this. And while I'm like quite good at having ideas, it's like, it's, it's something as a team that we need to own and like start to create and craft and come up with and say what do we really want it to be because it might be that that isn't what we want to do but we've got to find a purpose and a way of operating and a way of doing things that is like totally independent and totally motivating so that you wake up and you think what a day i'm going to play football which is like my first love and then when i finish playing i'm going to go do something else that like really turns me on yeah. and that's where like the magic the magic happens so I do like the idea of that because I feel like it is pretty unique to the women's game about how much we care about planting these seeds and what's left for the players who come after us. Yeah. So to create an identity in that, so even when I leave this club and Lena leaves this club, the 
U18 girls and all the girls that are coming up from that benefit from that, but also they step into that program and they're just, it just creates this chain that keeps going on. Yeah. And I think if you just look at our squad now, like they want to be involved. Yeah. They want to be a part of it. Like, yeah. It's only two weeks ago I have a player that she wanted to be a coach. And if it was possible here in this club yeah. uh, because she wanted to like have a coaching education, mm. I had Jessie after one week here, she asked me if I, if she in any way could help in the working in the club, I should tell her. And people, they want to get involved. And right. I, I think that's unique. And I think we need to like... Unique to women. Yeah. To, to, the, to the women game. Yeah. And that's like the that's like the energy, which we do a very poor job of like harvesting mm. at the moment. Um, and but it's not something that I'm not aware of. Mm -hmm. So I have like numerous uh, things within our organization where I'm like, yeah, I need to unlock that and I need to let allow that to like flourish and grow moving forwards. And this is one of the areas. But also, um, you've got to get the right structures behind it for it to be successful mm -hmm. and you know you could open an office now and say okay guys like our objective is to get 20 more girls into right to dream mm. and have it all fully funded mm -hmm. and then if you don't have the right leadership and the right structure then everybody's knocking on the door after like um two so what's weeks, needed like, to what take that next step you think i think who needs to join in on that like is it the like how can yeah. we take that next step? I know it's a difficult question. What are other so, players like, that need yeah. to be involved? Like, we'll do our part as players, mm. but outside stakeholders, I guess, who else needs to be involved? I think it's internal think? rather than okay. external. Mm. Um, and, like, honestly, uh, to give you, like, the real answer, it's about me getting some time to drive the agenda. Um, and we've had, like, the craziest year <laughs> with corona. <laughs> And, you know, this is a new project and, and, and so on. But, like, uh, I don't sleep very much. And when I'm not sleeping, I'm thinking about this stuff and getting frustrated of, like, mm. oh, I need to push this on further. Mm -hmm. But I think um, what we are doing is, like, building a critical mass with Pip, with Trina joining, with Kalida, with you guys, where we're starting to get to the point where it's like, okay, if we want to do something like this, then we've got some people who get us and they've been to Ghana and, and, and they understand what we stand for and they've been here long enough to say, okay, I could trust these guys and like actually put my heart into this as well. So I think we're moving like a little bit in the right direction, but you also need to, you need to win. Yeah. And you need to be like, the, the team needs to be successful and there needs to be something around that. Um, that's what I like learned with the men. It's like everybody's like, yeah, great values and youngest team and everything else. Football. But if you don't, mm -hmm. it's still football. Right. And yeah. so you've got to like keep the balance between mm. the two. And I think at least what we have done in a very short time with the women's is built a respected team. And we've got multiple levels like still to go. Mm -hmm. But at least we've got a base level where I can be in Copenhagen and someone can even see the the badge if I'm wearing it and say, oh, like you guys did a good job with the women's so there's like some level of of credibility that we've got there right. and and so it's the balance between the two things and maybe now we can start to lift the other one up a bit as well so as a player you would say that we should uh, keep fighting and see, keep pushing but still have a bit of patience that we will go there we will move forward yeah and um you know, it's like the, the, the challenge for our organization is that like, despite what you might read in the papers, I'm not an American oil billionaire <laughs> who can just like, uh, what, exactly. Cause then we'd All be, problems would be solved. <laughs> but that's what makes us, that's what makes us great is like, we have to find the solutions ourselves. Yeah. Mm. And I think when you have this thing of like, and like you played for a club in Sweden where the guy was just like, boom, I'm going to get Marta and I'm going to get Lena Roddick and I'm going to get all these guys and like, just do it. And I think for us, the fact that we have to grow organically and we have to like earn trust and credibility from each other and like go through the struggle means that like when you get out, then you've got like a really strong um, team and product at the end because you know how you built it. And like on the guy's side, like there was some dudes living in the house with me when the boys were living there and they're still working for us now and we know 
and like it doesn't matter what you tell us we know mm -hmm. like what we went through and what we did and i've driven the bus i've cooked the rice <laughs> i've taught the classes i've coached the team i've ordered the kit i've like begged for money for right to dream and everybody and like all my guys who started like they know so i think like what we do have with the women's is is like some people who are getting in and like what's amazing is we started in the fourth division here and we started with a trial in Tamale where girls were giving the baby to their mates while they came for the trial. Like that's how we start. Yeah. And I don't want Right to Dream as a movement ever to get into this situation where we're like, okay, now we're gonna do something else and we're just gonna like build it and do it with the way that the others do it. Like that's not, that's not who we are. And it's like in football, it's like really tempting to see the other side and think, oh, it would be great if it was like that. Right. And I think when Copenhagen start their women's, they'll do it like that. And that's like who they are and that's cool, but it's not who we are. And so that like organic building and trust and relationships and um, and like coming up with ideas and the fact that you guys can like really contribute to it all as well and feel like you own it. It's like the kind of, that's the way that we build stuff. And like quite often I wish it was the other way because it seems easier, but it's not like, then you're not like the real deal your plastic club mm -hmm. and I, but I still think as a football player that's maybe the biggest challenge to because you are in your normal day you're seeing just beside you how the men's like what kind of uh, how yeah what do you say like how uh, how the circumstances are for them mm -hmm. like what kind of like possibilities they had mm -hmm. and when I think in your normal day when you go to training mm. late in the evening and when you get kicked out of the gym or whatever then you can be like so frustrated and wanting like like wanting to believe in where we're gonna go but still struggling with not maybe being frustrated in being mm -hmm. in it at the moment of where we are mm. uh, I think that's kind of the biggest challenge yeah not to get too frustrated right not to get too fr frustrated but also recognize where we've come in a short period mm. but not be complacent with that either like wow we've done a lot in four years and we can just sit on that and be wow great job we've done a good job mm. but knowing that there's still more to that but yeah finding that balance between frustration and being complacent in that is, is tough and i think it's maybe about using that frustration you have yeah. to wanting to make it better right mm. to wanting it Put to it take it right to place. the next level yeah. instead of being angry of where you are and how it is but wanting it to use that to that as motivation yeah. when i when i started in ghana um ajax had a big academy in ghana Feyenoord had a big academy in ghana and then red bull came and built a big academy in ghana as well and like we were the little guys with um Uh, staying in, a, like living in my house. And like, sometimes I used to borrow my friends four by four and get the whole team into the four by four to go and play games. And then we would go and play against like Ajax and Feyenoord and Red Bull. And they had these beautiful campuses and all the money came from Europe to do it as they wanted it to do. And you would sit there and you'd be like, when the fuck are we gonna like be like mm. those guys? Mm -hmm. And how are we gonna get there? And like everything that we built was with our like blood and sweat and tears and now Wright's Dream is regarded as the best academy in Africa, mm -hmm. and Wright and Red Bull and uh, Feyenoord and uh, Ajax—they've all closed down, mm. and they've all left. And so there's like it's it's having the confidence to know that like mm. the like the battle that you're going through is those are the building blocks and those are the foundation of it, and there will always be like someone else that you look at, whether it's the men's team here, and then like when we get it to where we want it to be, we'll look at. Leon or we'll look at uh, uh, Rain or whoever we look at and we'll be like, ah, oh, like now we want it to be like that, but we don't actually want it to mm -hmm. be like that. Like what we want it to be like is maybe the vision that we talked about that, yes, training gets a lot better and it's at the right times and, and, and with all that kind of stuff. But afterwards we go and do maybe what we talked about earlier. Like we go and do that and that's us mm -hmm. and that's who we want to mm -hmm. be and we're cool with it. Um, and it's only with experience like, when I was, I don't want to sound like the wise guy, but like when I was your age, <laughs> then it was like, I had all of that stuff. And it was like, oh, I just want it to come quicker and I want it to be different. And mm. why does it have to be so difficult? Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I listened to this um, podcast called How I Built This, um, which is like they get all the most successful entrepreneurs in the world who've built like all the big companies that we've heard of. Mm -hmm. And they all have the same story, which is like this hustle and looking at others and wishing it was like that and, you know, operating out of their kitchen. And like, you, you hear about people running, um, you know, now running amazing restaurants who were like hustling and cooking it upstairs and running it downstairs and doing all this kind of crazy stuff. And that's like the fabric that builds success. And this fast track to like buying it the other way, it's not sustainable. Right. Like even if it is business sustainable, it's not like um, values sustainable, you know? And like you, you end up being there and everyone's like, like, who are we and what do we stand for? And I like to build organizations where it's like, hey guys, do you remember when it was shit? And do you remember when it was fourth division? And do you remember when we used to look at the men and say this and that and we want equal pay? And now we're in a situation where it's not, and it's this, and we're looked at and respected. Like Africa's a big place, huge continent. And the thing that started in our living room is now the most respected in in Africa. So I've got that like track record to say with the girls, like to stay calm yeah. and be like, we're going there. Like I, I genuinely believe that we have like the brains around the table, which is the first most important thing to figure it out. And now we've got to like, carve out some more time and spend some more time focusing on this and, and like have the right people on the bus and find the, uh, find that next level. But like we found a lot and as an organization, like we're the only organization in the world that has a residential girls Academy in Africa. Like that's, it's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what we've started with the Academy here as well, like even though we're not satisfied with either, like we're way ahead of others and we've got these building blocks to like to start from. So it's just how we do it. It's like, a, and, and I don't want us to change from being like an organization that has to do the hustle and has to has to like sweat and, and, and build things with our own hands. And then we um, like, then we know when we live in the house, like how the house got built rather than have somebody like come in and just put it up like those Ajax or Red Bull examples and then mm -hmm. you live in the house and you don't respect it because someone just gave it to you. Right. So that's what you guys are doing. Like with every tackle and every pass and everything that you do is like you're building the house. Yeah, and that feels cool to be a part of that. I'd much rather be a part of a team that's that I help build its way to Champions mm -hmm. League than to just go to a club who's already there and I get to play in the game. It's a much different feeling when you know that you've put in that effort and that time to get to that place. And I can't wait until we get there. Mm. <laughs> that was the reason I chose to go back to FC Norseland when I returned yeah. to be a part of building something up right. yeah. and to make it different from what was already here. Yeah. Um, maybe to end with, like, if we should, like, if you should think about how we as players uh, could help working towards the vision mm. future-wise. If you have any thoughts about that to the players. I think on the pitch, um, it, uh, I don't want to sound wrong, but like it is what it is at the moment. And it's like, we, um, we need to try and find that next level on the pitch and we need to push and we need to keep the results and we need to like, keep pushing through there. And then I think this is a great example of how we're finding the next level, you know, getting the conversation. I get to spend two hours with you guys, which I don't do very often. And like what we've really had here is like a business meeting about like what's the next level. And mm. I planted some seeds for us to think about. And we need to like spend more time getting around the table saying, okay, we're here, we're full time, but you know, like you've got, you're playing, you've got another job here. You, are you still studying? No, not no. studying. So, no. but you've got time and then other, but you've got other responsibilities as well. And so it's like, where do we find the time to sit down and like really strategize and say, okay, let's take that next step. Mm. Um, and I think if this year hadn't been so crazy, we would have been a bit further on because you know, we were having some meetings before and everything mm. was 
but then we got into March and we're like, okay, are we going to be here in July? Yeah. And I, yeah. you, were you there for the all staff meeting? Did I? Yeah, I was. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I told the story, and you guys know, like, and then we've come through in great shape, and the group will be profitable this year, and uh, I'm almost certain we can say it'll be profitable next year as well. Which in Corona, like, nobody's saying okay. that. So it's like, okay, we can, you know all the stuff that we did to lay the foundations and to ha and stick to our values which meant people stuck by us and and then everything we did on the boys side with youth development to mean that we have great players that can be sold to sustain the whole organization like that stuff's all been done for 20 years so i think we've got a good platform to like take the next take the next step but it's much better doing it with a with a super league of women's team than it is like if we're just starting fresh and having all these big ideas and you guys have, like I've said, you've been to Ghana, you've seen it. Have you interacted with Right Stream USA at all? With any only, stuff Kylie does? only a little bit through Kylie. Yeah, so like a little bit maybe of awareness of what's going on mm -hmm. over there as well and you understand it a bit and, and let's kind of make sure that we uh, maybe take some of those ideas that I've floated out today and, and for you guys to generate some ideas around how we can push mm -hmm. that on a bit. But your point around like that feeling of Champions League, I would like that feeling also that when that when you leave or when you retire, that there's a ton of girls who got into academies in other parts of the world who you know, like I was part of that. Mm -hmm. And then you see them and I get that in my life and it's, more, it's actually even more satisfying with the girls and the boys, but it's like when you see Adelaide going to law school, it's like, I did that. Mm -hmm. And I know that's like part of it. And I'd like a, a women's club who'd be able to say, we did that. That was part of it but also for you as an individual to say like i did my part in that whatever mm. it was and then that's like a purpose-driven football team mm. and i don't think that really exists um on that kind of level so that's what i want us to try and build well, thanks for your time today <laughs> okay yeah i think we probably went over time but good conversation that's we'll fine. do that <laughs>